Spain is one of the EU's biggest countries, almost encircling the noticeably smaller Portugal. The disparity between the two extends to their population, economy and armed forces. So if, hypothetically speaking, Spain wanted to rekindle some of the centuries-old animosities between the two and invade Portugal, could it do it within a year? Spain and Portugal had centuries of disagreements, competition as colonial powers and even wars. Today their relations are good, but does that mean either of them is letting down their guard? Say the war starts suddenly, with no outside party interference. Portugal would certainly be in a pickle, since it trades a lot with its neighbor. But more about that later. The Spanish ground combat troop forces are several times bigger. The numbers shown include active army troops and marines. Portugal is leaning a bit more on its reserve component, though. The figure represents the part of the reserves which either train periodically throughout the year or have recently left the army, so they are still fairly well trained. Both sides could, of course, mobilize and conscript many more into the army. The two figures shown aren't directly comparable, though. The Portuguese one shows a planned force for which there is some kind of organizational structure. The Spanish figure concerns overall mobilization potential, if they conscript most of the appropriate population, as estimated by their Ministry of Defense. Considering the population difference, with a similar mobilization push, Portugal should be able to raise some half a million troops. But to mobilize so much of their actual civilian population would take upward of half a year, even in the biggest emergency. Other resources, such as their paramilitary forces, might aid them in the meantime. Both Spain and Portugal have a national policing force, gendarmerie of a sort, that would likely get used as some sort of aid in defenses. The topography of the area is fairly conducive to large military formations. That would not go in Portugal's favor. The one thing that would help Portugal at first is initial positioning of units. Being more compact and having no threats from the sea, Portugal could start fortifying its borders right away. Or even going into Spain at certain locations, if it deems it necessary. For example, if a quick raid over the border could result in a local force concentration superiority, before the Spaniards assemble. The Spanish 7th and 11th brigades are quite close to Portugal, and might not be able to pull out entirely in time, if the Portuguese try for a rapid short-term incursion. But Portugal lacks its own forces up in the north, across the border from the Spanish 7th Brigade. So it's questionable if it would make it in time with sufficient forces. And the topography is somewhat more coarse, with more hills, which is again not suitable for quickly moving large concentrations of vehicles. But Portugal does have quite a concentration of forces, including rapid reaction units, in their center. So the Spanish 11th Brigade might very well get shelled and routed from their bases, probably having to leave some of their equipment behind. Of course, such early success would mean little in the overall scheme of things. Spanish air forces would get up in the air quickly, and probably suppress Portuguese air forces within days. The Spanish side has almost six times as many combat planes, and except for their Navy's Harriers, they are on average more capable than the Portuguese F-16s. Spain has a token number of cruise missiles, but they wouldn't really be that important to Spain anyway. With so many more fighters than Portugal, and the fact that Portugal lacks modern SAM systems of decent reach, even the bombing raids with laser and satellite guided bombs would be impossible to prevent for the Portuguese. Portuguese old Chaparral SAMs wouldn't even be able to reach Spanish high-flying planes. On the other hand, Spanish fighter jets would be a bit more free to act offensively, as Spain has a rather robust SAM system network, which would endanger possible Portuguese air attacks. The Spanish would eventually be able to assemble their ground forces around the Portuguese borders, and push into Portugal within a week or a month depending on just what kind of force they'd want to start the offensive with. As mentioned, they have more ground forces, but not all would be available for the invasion of Portugal at the start of the war. Both sides, but Spain especially, have overseas territories, which have their own army contingents. Portugal maintains two infantry battalions at the Azores and another one at Madeira. Spain has much larger forces stationed overseas. They have a full brigade worth of troops at the Canary Islands, and one brigade worth of troops at Ceuta and Melilla each. 
Those two are Spanish enclaves surrounded by Moroccan shores. And they also have roughly a half a brigade at the Balearic Islands in the Med. Without waiting for the reshuffling of forces, Spain could thus pour into Portugal with roughly eight brigades worth of troops, minus whatever possible losses of that one brigade that they suffered at the hands of the Portuguese early raids over the border. Spain is however not just numerically superior, but also better equipped for a ground war. They've got roughly ten times more tanks. While Portuguese tanks are as modern as the best Spanish tanks, the sheer difference in numbers ruins any tech advantage Portugal might have. When it comes to other combat vehicles, Portugal is still behind, though the difference is not as pronounced as with tanks. Portuguese armored personnel carriers and infantry fighting vehicles are generally lighter, while the Spanish have more and heavier tracked vehicles. The topography of the area across most of the border is fairly flat farms and some hills without major urban centers. Spanish armored formations, not really threatened from the air, would have a field day. Up north, there are some mountains, so a push from the directions of A Coruña or even from Salamanca into northern Portugal probably wouldn't proceed as quickly. And in the south, the river Guadiana marks the border and would likely be populated by Portuguese troops in time, on its western banks. Guadiana is very wide there, between 100 and 200 meters. The Spanish would first have to secure a bridgehead, which they would eventually probably succeed at. With the air power and artillery edge, the defenders would be suppressed. Spain does have over four times as many artillery pieces, and has a more robust inventory of aircraft useful for air insertions, be it via paradrops or helicopter assaults. In addition to the transport helicopter edge, Spain also operates attack helicopters, which could come in handy in assault ops over the rivers or beaches. The main push through the middle of Portugal would come quickly, possibly forking into two main thrusts, one marching towards Lisbon and another going south to cut off the Portuguese forces there. Lisbon itself would be somewhat protected by the river Tagus, which snakes southwards as well. Going north of it to circumvent it, would be harder and slower for Spain, as the hills are plentiful there and their armored and even air force edge would not be as pronounced there. While the ground offensives would roll over mainland Portugal, a war over the seas would be waged as well. Spain would have two main goals for its navy, to cut off merchant shipping going into Portugal, trying to choke its economy, and to take Portuguese islands in the Atlantic. For both to succeed, the Portuguese navy would first need to be neutralized. After that, Spain's own overseas territories, such as the Canary Islands, would be safe. Luckily for Spain, Portugal has precisely zero ships for amphibious assaults. The last of their Bombarda-class landing craft were retired in 2015. And even though a larger landing ship was planned as a replacement, it has yet to be procured. Out in the Atlantic, the Portuguese would be hard-pressed to maintain their islands, let alone endanger Spanish ones. The Spanish Navy is larger and better equipped. Spanish ships carry longer range Standard 1 and Standard 2 air defense missiles, while Portuguese vessels have to make do with shorter range sea sparrows. Portugal's best bet, navy wise, would be to make use of their submarines. Two boats compared to Spain's three, but the Portuguese ones are quite modern, with air independent propulsion, very quiet, and very good for ambushes. So going after the Azores or the island of Madeira would not be without its risks for the Spanish. Spain does have a smaller aircraft carrier with Harrier jets, but it may be more useful for launching helicopter assaults, for which it was also designed. But it's likely Spain would be in no rush to actually take those islands and risk their big ships to submarine attacks. Most likely Spain would first hunt for the Portuguese ships. Months later, a decent part of the Spanish Air Force would also be available to support the landings. And air assets would possibly neutralize some of the Portuguese submarine threat. In the meantime, at roughly the half-year point after the start of the war, Spanish ground forces would find themselves in heavy fighting for the urban centers. By then, Spain would have many more civilians mobilized into the army, and they would be even somewhat competent after six months of training. The Portuguese mobilization effort would be somewhat hampered by the fact that a fair part of their country would be occupied, although most of the population in Portugal does live between Porto and Lisbon. Eventually the Azores and Madeira would fall, 
Spain would likely lose some ships in the process and many soldiers on the beaches, but the Portuguese troops on the islands would be low on supplies. Supplies within mainland Portugal would also be quite problematic. Spain supplies roughly a third of all Portuguese imports. But even worse, a lot of their other imports from the EU come via Spain. All those would cease coming in. The rest of their imports are by merchant ships, but eventually all the major ports would be blockaded by Spain. The flow of goods into Portugal would slow down to a trickle within months. Even food would become scarce at some point. While Portugal nominally achieves some 80% level of self-sufficiency when it comes to food production, a lot of that comes from the flatlands in the south, which would mostly be occupied by Spain. And after oil and gas runs out, the Portuguese economy would be fighting for survival. So the Portuguese war effort would eventually atrophy to light infantry fighting in the hills and urban centers, as there would be no supplies for anything else in the last several months of the first year of the war. The Spanish economy is not only larger, but their defense industry is more diverse and could help in keeping their army restocked. While Portugal's most important defense items are personal weapons, Spain can also make its own combat vehicles, mortars, AT guns, ships and partially various aircraft. Considering all that, it's not even surprising that the war would end with a fairly easy Spanish victory. The number of casualties would be first and foremost decided by the will to fight. If the Portuguese would refuse to capitulate, the Spanish might eventually suffer hundreds of thousands of dead troops by the end of the war. Though that would come at the cost of whole generations of Portuguese obliterated. Whether it would be worth it against such odds would be questionable. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.